topic, coronary heart disease. It's uh, when I was first tasked to present this topic, it's, um, there's so much to talk about. So we're going to try and cover lots of different aspects and it will be a bit of a sort of a revisiting some of the things that you've come across at medical school and then things that you would be experiencing as junior doctors as well. So um, moving on. So the content what we're going to cover on uh, is coronary anatomy. We'll cover the pathophysiology of coronary heart disease, um, clinical presentations of coronary heart disease, how we investigate for this and the different management options for coronary uh, heart disease, including the surgical strategy as well, which we're involved in on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so essentially coronary anatomy, revisiting some of those anatomy uh, books that you've uh, covered at medical school. So the uh, right and uh, left coronary ostia come out of the uh, aortic sinuses just uh, at the aortic root. And um, essentially the left coronary ostia then divides into the LAD. I don't know if my mouse pointer is able to uh, work as well. Um, Yes, uh, fantastic. Good. So you can see coming here, this is sort of an anterior view of the heart and the uh, left anterior descending artery covers, uh, comes down courses in the interventricular septum and it supplies diagonal branches which cover some of the lateral wall and septal branches which perforate and go into the anterior two thirds of the septum. We've got the circumflex artery which wraps around the atrioventricular group and on the right, your uh, right coronary artery comes out quite anteriorly and then courses in the right atrioventricular groove as well. It's another diagram just illustrating uh, what we've just described. Um, sorry, going back there. And uh, you can see that the uh, right coronary artery gives us acute marginal branches and um, can uh, then develop into the posterior descending artery as well which supplies the inferior septum of the heart. And knowing the coronary anatomy is vital, not just for patients who present with coronary heart disease, but also planning a procedure, whether it's an aortic valve replacement, congenital heart surgery, or whether you're doing aortic surgery and you may need to manipulate the coronary ostia. So knowing the coronary anatomy is vital, despite doing cardiac surgery on other areas of the heart as well. So. Um, and understanding that your operation can affect the blood supply to different territories as well. So as mentioned earlier, the left main stem is the um, initial opening of the left coronary ostia, and then it bifurcates into this uh, circumflex and into the LAD, and in, in about 10% of cases, you get a ramus intermedius as well, which comes and you get a trifurcating picture. As mentioned, the LAD, uh, has, di has diagonals which uh, come off and supply the anterior lateral wall partially and uh, then the septum uh, branches which come down into the septum of the um, heart um, and supply the anterior two-thirds. The LAD can be divided into different sections, the um, proximal, mid and distal and so the uh, proximal LAD is from the bifurcation where it starts at the, um, at the beginning of the division of the left main to the first septal. Mid LAD is then from the uh, first uh, septal to the last diagonal, or second diagonal, and then onwards is the uh, uh, distal LAD. Uh, when we talk about dominance of coronary arteries, uh, we are basically referring to which of the coronary arteries supplies the posterior inferior wall of the ventricle, the uh, inferior septum. So in most cases, the PDA uh, comes from the um, uh, right coronary and uh, in about 15% of cases it comes off the left and then you get a mixture as well about 20-25% of patients have a co-dominant system. This is particularly important again when protecting the heart and also um, making sure that uh, you are um, if you need to revascularize you are covering the territory for the inferior aspect of, of the heart as well. Okay, so that's just a quick world stop um, tour of coronary anatomy and uh, uh, how the um, branches are divided. Right, Card coronary heart disease, pathophysiology. So it's one of the commonest causes you'll see of patients coming into the hospital, whether it's in the context of an acute coronary syndrome, like a unstable angina, NSTEMI or a STEMI. Um, so 
uh, that would be something in the more of an acute setting that you would see in your medical takes. Other aspects of coronary heart disease may present in the form of people who've had coronary heart disease for a chronic period of time and they get cardiomyopathy and they may have heart failure. And certain conditions also accelerate the process of coronary heart disease um, occurring. So patients who've got diabetes or they've got renal disease, they may have an accelerated proportion of, um, uh, of coronary heart disease as well. But today, for the purpose of this uh, talk, we're going to cover uh, acute coronary syndromes and talking about NSTEMIs, un STEMIs, unstable angina and chronic stable angina and how we deal with, um, how we deal with this, uh, this sort of spectrum of disease. Um, it's a very common problem, as I mentioned, and about every eight minutes in the UK, someone is dying from a coronary heart disease. So it's a very, you know, a huge burden on the population in the UK. Um, so in this course of this presentation, in, in 45 minutes, we probably lose six people in the population um, who have passed away from a, a, an acute event from coronary heart disease. So it keeps us busy and it keeps the cardiologists busy. So um, it's an, essentially the manifestation of coronary heart disease is due to most of the commonly coronary obstruction or a redu reduction in the lumen of the blood supply down the coronary. And essentially you're not getting the supply and demand of blood to the heart muscle. Um, the consequence of acute coronary syndromes are basically 12% of patients who with a STEMI die within six months. Um, 13% of patients with an NSTEMI will die within six months. These are patients who have received some sort of cardiological treatment. 8% of patients will die, uh, you know, those who um, with unstable angina within six months. And also coronary artery disease is strongly related to other cardiovascular disease, so such as um, uh, cerebral vascular accidents as well. And ongoing ischemia, ongoing uh, acute coronary syndromes as well. So pathology, uh, the, the, the terminology of acute coronary syndromes, whether it's a STEMI or an NSTEMI uh, or unstable angina, essentially relates to what we see um, on a um, pathological level. So from a STEMI, yeah, uh, ST elevation, myocardial infarction, you see an ST elevation on the ECG correlating to a particular territory which is affected, but essentially you get a total occlusion in, the, um, in that territory. That may recanalize and blood supply may be restored either because the thrombus moves out of the way, but it takes a short period of time to develop an infarct, or it may be related to thrombolysis or um, a PCI that is needed to open up that lumen again. But once that damage is done, you get um, you can get a full uh, transmural infarct. And in the old term for this was a Q-wave MI, where you see Q-waves on the ECG and that suggests they've got a, uh, a, a infarct and, and uh, death of the myocardium. Uh, unstable angina and STEMI is essentially uh, patients who've got a re sudden reduction or a reduction in the uh, luminal size of their um, coronary artery and subsequently the demand for the heart is not being met by the supply and so patients get symptoms as a related to that. And then chronic stable angina are patients who've developed angina over a period of time who are managing to do activities but have an onset of symptoms related with that activity as well. So commonly you will come across terms of chronic stable angina, unstable angina, that's patients who get chest pain without, with, um, uh, with minimal exertion or at rest. Um, they might not have an ECG changes, they might have some T-wave inversion. They'll, you do a troponin test, it's negative. And STEMIs and STEMIs, typically you do get some release of the uh, uh, myocardial uh, enzymes. Various factors are to play with the development of um, atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries. There's a, a whole host of uh, mechanisms with um, platelet adherence and um, with uh, monocytes and uh, different types of uh, cholesterol type cells that adhere to damaged endothelium. And this can take over many years to develop. Uh, and suddenly, if a, an acute event where you have a vulnerable plaque that either dislodges or ruptures due to the shear stresses uh, of blood flow going through an artery which has a plaque uh, present, can lead to a, um, uh, a, a 
whole host of events which can lead to reduction in the coronary size lumen or a total occlusion. So if you imagine a coronary artery that has got a plaque in situ, for example, um, if you look at this diagram here, uh, towards the right hand side, you can see that there's a reduction in the in the lumen size and over the years a plaque has become built up. What can what you can find at times is that if there's a certain event, whether it's an inflammatory event or whether there's hypertension or other risk factors or smoking, for example, that can lead to uh, changes into the endothelium that can make these plaques vulnerable and that can shear off the cap, exposing the rich uh, cholesterol laden uh, plaque content and leading to platelet aggregation and clotting and, and reduction of the lumen size further than reducing the blood supply to the heart muscle. This is a diagram just showing how plaques develop over the course of time. And this is a, underneath is an image uh, from intravascular ultrasounds via catheters in the coronary artery to determine how um, plaques reduce the lumen size. And towards the end here, you can see quite a stable um, plaque, but a very reduced lumen size present there. Okay. So we're going to go on to a clinical scenario because um, I'm sure you'll be seeing lots of new patients in acute settings as junior doctors. Um, and so what I may do is pick on some of the audience, if that's okay. Hanad, is that okay if we uh, sort of um, pick on participants to... Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Either pick on someone or if anyone volunteers, they can put their hand. OK, fantastic. So um, essentially, we'll, go, we'll start off with a scenario where you have a 58-year-old um, uh, gentleman, Mr. Bennett's his name. Um, he's come in as an acute take at the, uh, in the hospital. Um, he mentions that he woke up in the early hours this morning with severe chest pain. OK. And... Um, your SPR is uh, reviewing the ECG and he's asked you to sort of continue with the uh, history and um, to ask questions and find out about Mr. Bennett why he's coming to hospital. OK, so um, do we have a chat function here or is it to, or should I just pick on participants? You can you can pick on someone. Yeah. OK, uh, let's have a look. Um, Sumant. Luhana. Hello. Hi, hi. Uh, so um, what sort of questions would you want to ask Mr. Bennett about his symptoms and how he's, um, um, why he's coming to hospital? Yeah, I mean, um, I'd want to know if he's going to have ever had pain like this before, um, when the pain started, what he was doing when the pain started. Um, yeah. Is it kind of getting worse? Is it getting better? Um, and kind of go through a squit ass of, of the pain, basically. So is it central, sharp? Um, is it worse when he breathes in, for example? Very good, very good. So essentially, you know, you want to have a systematic a history, things that you've been taught at medical school or in, you know, you've, in, during your foundation year, you want to find out everything associated with the pain. So where is it? What brings it on? What makes it better? Does the pain travel anywhere? Is there anything that you take or makes it go away or what makes it worse? And in terms of severity as well, scoring the pain, and how bad it is out of 10. That's a, a good starting point. And with this, with his, what the information he'll be telling you, you'll be able to sort of develop a list of uh, differential diagnoses and then be able to um, uh, work your way through that and what the, likely, um, what the likely cause of his chest pain is. Okay, so he reports he's been having chest pain for about a month. Um, it usually comes on after dinner or after he's done a bit of exertion and he gets the time feeling around his chest and this morning when he woke up yeah, it was a crushing pain and um, he also goes to his left arm and he was feeling quite sweaty and nauseous this morning and it lasted about 40 minutes and it only eased away once the ambulance came by and gave him a spray and so it was quite severe pain this morning and now it's uh, about a four out of ten okay so there's quite a lot of information he's given you there about what's uh, caused this pain and how it's presented and how long it's been going on for. Um, is there any other information you would like to get from the patient? So let's find out from someone else. Uh, uh, Antonio, Antonio, are you able to um, contribute to ask what other information would you like to find out from Mr. Bennett? 
I um, if takes drugs, medicine, if he has diabetes, so. Great, yeah, okay, so you're going into sort of cardiac risk factors, whether he's got diabetes. Um, anything else? Um, other comorbidities. Uh, comorbidities, okay. Yeah. All right, okay, very good. I'll just ask someone else now, uh, Omar Zebde. Yeah, so... Hi, uh, hi. So are you able to tell me sort of different risk factors for um, coronary heart disease? Yeah, so you want to take a social history as well, see if, uh, what the functional baseline's like, the, whether or not they're a smoker. Um, obviously, judging from their BMI, how far can they actually walk before getting a short of breath? Good. So, so, you know, activity in their lifestyle, whether it's sedentary lifestyle, we've covered in diabetes, whether they smoke, um, any other risk factors you'd want to find out about the patient or what would cause coronary heart disease? So blood pressure, cholesterol. Um, yeah, and family history, um, um, yeah. all of those things. So remember, um, uh, cardiac risk factors can be divided into modifiable and non modifiable. Um, so, you know, lifestyle related, whether they smoke, whether they're um, got, uh, whether they're overweight, whether they're sedentary, um, things like uh, their uh, um, comorbidities such as hypertension, diabetes, uh, can also play effect and non-modifiable factors such as their family history as well uh, are important to uh, establish. Good. So, you, you know, you want to, uh, so these are the different sort of lists of uh, risk factors that we've discussed modifiable and non-modifiable. Um, and then he tells you he's diabetic, um, his father died of an MI and he smokes about 30 a day. And he's also uh, on the uh, obese scale on his BMI as well. Um, and, you know, nothing unusual from what we've already discussed from his other bits of information as well, uh, in terms of his medication and um, what he does. So he's a lorry driver, smoke, still smoking 30 a day, um, and is, uh, drinks about three pints of beer daily. Okay, so you've got a lot of information there. You've taken a full history from this patient about why he's coming to hospital. Remember, he came in with chest pain that woke him up from bed and you asked him detailed questions about his risk factors and so forth. So um, what do you think the most likely cause of his uh, admission is the presentation? Uh, let's pick on... Felicia, Felicia Niarco. Hi. Hi. Uh, okay, so yeah, I'm thinking first and foremost, my first differential will be an MI. Okay, good. Yep. Yeah. Then um, you would Give want to rule two out other the differentials. Yep, yeah, two other differentials. Okay, yeah. So an MI, I would also be thinking about. Um, other causes of chest pain like pneumonia or okay. any other thing. Good, okay. So, uh, you know, there's a whole host of um, different uh, differentials. We'll come on to those in a moment as well. Um, so you go on to do your examination and the patient obviously at this stage is uh, quite clammy. You can make a general inspection at the end of the bed, he's obese. Um, his uh, heart rate is elevated at uh, 110 beats per minute. And um, in addition to that, um, he's quite hypertensive. Um, you move on to your cardiovascular examination. And again, uh, heart sounds are inaudible. That may, be, that may be related to his sort of body habitus. It may be related to other factors such as, um, uh, well, other factors that reduce your heart sounds, things like pericardial effusion, um, or, um, and then also looking at their capillary refill. So doing a full examination as again, you know, looking at the end of the bed, how does the patient appear? Does he appear comfortable? Is he clutching his chest? What's he attached to? In, is he on a monitored bed? What sort of drugs are running? Or does he have a spray next to his uh, bedside table? Um, and then moving on to your cardiovascular and respiratory examinations, again, as you would have been taught at medical school, doing a comprehensive exam from inspection, palpation, percussion, and uh, auscultation. Good, so uh, again, as mentioned already, dyspnea, clammy, pallor, 
going on to looking at his hands. Are there any evidence of uh, nicotine stains or any signs of uh, familial hypercholesterolemia? Looking at the patient's JVP and their legs, so do they have, a, have any evidence of um, scars? Uh, sorry, any evidence of edema or swelling in their in their peripheries, in their an ankles or in, in the sacrum? And then looking at previous scars, has a patient had a previous operation? Are they known to have ischemic heart disease and have had a bypass operation in the past? Um, or uh, any other operate any other operations in the past? Uh, look at the feel the pulses as well, making sure that you've got equal pulses uh, bilaterally. Any a any radio radial delay. And then listening to for murmurs and listening for um, the lungs. Are there any evidence of pulmonary edema, fine crepitations? So as you're going through this systematic approach of doing your examination or when you are asking all the questions in your history, you're narrowing down that list of differential diagnosis. So even though the top alarm bell ringing here is an acute coronary syndrome, but you need to think, could this be an aortic dissection? Could this be pleurisy and the patient's got a pneumonia? All of these things need to be there in the background and you're just you know, eliminating them as you go through your examination and through your history, okay? So we mentioned that uh, from the differential diagnosis, an acute coronary syndrome is the top for differential. Could it be a PE? Could it be an aortic dissection? Esophageal rupture, not very likely, but it's still on the list. Or could it be musculoskeletal? Okay, so um, this is just a summary again of the importance of a careful patient assessment, you know, in terms of when they report of shortness of breath, is it associated with exercise? Is it associated with rest? Does it have an effect on them lying down flat? How much, how has their activity changed in the last few months? Uh, or is it something that's happened quite suddenly within the last couple of days? Um, chest pain, again, can represent a whole host of type of a uh, whole host of conditions and it's, it's essential to do, it's ascertain whether this is a cardiac sounding chest pain or whether this is related to um, uh, other another factors such as pleurisy or uh, a esophageal uh, problem. Um, again, looking at other factors that increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. So do they have any um, uh, previous history of diabetes um, and uh, problems with uh, hypertension, do they have problems with peripheral vascular disease? And then if you're coming from a surgical point of view when you're reviewing a patient that may be considered for a coronary artery bypass surgery, you've got to think of questions or areas that may complicate your surgery. So for example, has a patient received any radiation to the chest? Is that going to make a problem with regards to harvesting the left internal mammary artery? Has a patient had varicose veins or veins stripping from the legs? And is that going to make an issue with conduit? Um, does a patient suffer from peripheral vascular disease? And will that make a problem for um, issues with a conduit harvest and, going on and establishing cardiopulmonary bypass because they've got a calcified aorta? So you've got to think of how this patient, so it depends on what sort of hat you're approaching the patient. If you're approaching it from a patient who's got, um, if, you're, if you are working for a cardiothoracic team and you're reviewing a patient for surgery, then you've got to think of a whole host of other things that could complicate the procedure further and needing to investigate those a bit more. Um, for example, also, you know, as a patient got a history of GI bleeding, Melina or PR bleeding, if you're going to do an operation and we're going to do this on cardiopulmonary bypass, how would they respond to heparin? Are they going to, are they likely to have a massive hemorrhage? So there's lots of different factors to take into account. If you're dealing it from a cardiology point of view, then you know you need to look at is this something that is an acute coronary syndrome? Is it an STEMI? Is uh, is it uh, what the time frame of the onset of symptoms to when they presented? Does the patient need to be rushed to the cath lab, or do we need to start this patient on uh, antiplatelet medication, put them on a monitor, and then uh, plan for a urgent catheterization angi angiogram uh, whilst they're an inpatient? So. Lots of different things to consider as well. Okay. Uh, again, you know, things like immunosuppression as well, different medications that patients take. Again, if you're considering the patient from a surgical perspective, will that have an impact on wound healing? Does a patient need to have uh, a higher dose of steroids prior to going under the knife, under anesthesia, so that they don't get an Addisonian crisis? Um, 
or and do any of these sort of new um, disease modifying or monoclonal antibodies that they may be taking for uh, Crohn's disease or rheumatic arth uh, rheumatoid arthritis, do they need to be stopped um, preoperatively as well? Okay. So uh, essentially, you're you're working, you're thinking as a as a physician and as a surgeon. You know, you've got to you've got to cover all the bases and and surgical considerations as I mentioned. You know, peripheral vascular examination is important because you want to establish whether you can harvest conduit from the legs. Um, consider, you know, investigating patients who've got different blood pressures in, in left to right arms, whether there's a evidence of a dissection or whether this is a problem with regards to um, uh, you know, uh, uh, thrombosis in the subclavian and whether that needs to be investigated further. Looking for varicose veins, as I mentioned, um, and also looking and considering patients who've got peripheral vascular disease, do they need to um, um, do they need to have? Uh, can they be? Can they be assessed for uh, radial artery harvesting? Uh, is that feasible or not? Um, people who've got thoracic uh, radiation from previous cancer of the chest can, is, can can we take a left internal mammary in that situation? Okay, so lots of things to consider there. So investigations and why, Let's, uh, so you've done the full history, you've done a full examination, patient looks clammy, they're hypertensive, tachycardic, they're a bit more comfortable now since they've received some of that um, GTN spray and uh, some pain relief while they've been waiting. Uh, let's ask uh, Calvin, uh, what would you want to do next? Investigation wise. Oh, hello. So investigations Hi. wise, I would like to do a cardiovascular examination followed by investigations. Uh, uh, I'd like to do uh, ECG first and foremost. Good. Uh, observations generally, uh, O2 saturation. And then bloods wise, importantly, would be something like a troponin. And uh, um, what else would you do? Um, could you BNP if they if you suspect heart failure as well, if it's longstanding? Okay, good, good. So uh, we'll move on to the different things so ecg very important exactly it's fundamental that you have an ecg and maybe you might need several ecgs uh, to look for dynamic changes is there any evidence of uh, ongoing ischemia and um, is there any other associated features uh, determining what territory is particularly affected does a patient have any um, arrhythmia related to their ischemia chest x-ray is also a very easy test to perform and that can be done portably or uh, in the department depending on how stable the patient is so these are sort of the baseline they should be going off automatically um, bloods wise you want to do a full blood count because patients with anemia that can precipitate uh, angina symptoms as well and then looking at the urea and electrolytes as it gives you an indication of whether there's any underlying renal disease as well, and a troponin test as well, which is also very uh, important, as you mentioned, to determine whether there's been any damage to the myocardial uh, tissue. Um, and then if um, uh, you're concerned about PEs or um, dissection, and then D-dimer would be uh, useful as well. Okay, so management. So Essentially, it depends whether the patient is uh, coming into an acute setting in the uh, sort of acute medical unit or whether they are um, coming through a rapid access pain clinic or on the ward. And, you know, whether you're managing a patient with chronic stable angina or an acute coronary syndrome. Um, and so, you know, with the chronic stable angina, it's important that patients have uh, some degree of antiplatelets, so aspirin, and also what you want to do is reduce the myocardial demand. So uh, drugs such as beta blockers are very important as well uh, for the for the long stay uh, management of chronic stable angina while they're being worked up um, for what the if uh, what sort of management the patient should receive, whether it's a, a stent or a coronary artery bypass surgery. With acute coronary syndromes, the patients are presenting with ST elevation or non-ST elevation MI or unstable angina, then you know, initially for first and foremost, you want to stabilize the patient. Um, you may have heard the mnemonic of MONA, which is morphine, oxygen, nitrates, and aspirin, um, and then subsequently adding in a dual antiplatelet. There are various scoring systems that you may have heard about, such as the GRACE scoring system or um, uh, uh, to risk stratify the events of how likely their uh, coronary event is likely to cause uh, further problems. 
and so they may uh, be a, selected for an urgent uh, coronary catheterization to establish whether the patient needs any further in, um, stents as an inpatient and whether they can have dual antiplatelets. Okay, so um, we've covered things like, you know, reducing myocardial demand with beta blockers, or if patients are asthmatic or got peripheral vascular disease, then there may be contraindicators, so you might have to consider calcium channel blockers there. Secondary prevention, also very important, you know, giving statins uh, to reduce that cholesterol, and it's important to do a blood test to sort of see what their uh, baseline cholesterol levels are and triglyceride levels. So you've mentioned about some of those tests already. The ECGs are important. They, they're vital. They need to be, uh, they need to be uh, the first and foremost an automatic investigation that's requested. And they can give you a whole host of information, you know, whether which territory shows evidence of ischemia, whether it's in the inferior aspect or whether it's um, anterior lateral. Um, these are particular uh, sort of information. This particular information is very, very important. Um, here we have an ECG, um, which uh, demonstrates something. So I'm gonna pick on someone to just give me a diagnosis. Doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. Charlotte Hope, can you tell me what you see on this ECG, please? Hi. Hi. Uh, so I can see some T-wave inversion in V4 uh, in ABF. And there's some ST elevation in V3, so it looks like a STEMI. Very good. And if you want to just uh, tell me what territory would be worrying you? you mm, probably anterior. Very good. Fantastic. So there's an anterior STEMI here going on, ST elevation in V2, V3. Um, and you've got some T-wave version as well, as you mentioned correctly. So it's an anterior STEMI as well. Uh, very good. Okay, sometimes patients present with an ECG, which like, looks like this. Uh, let's pick on someone. Let's have a look here. Anoop Sumal. Hi, uh, hi. Do you want to just describe what you see on this ECG? Just a diagnosis, you don't need to present it formally, just. Uh... Hello, Una. Uh, Anoop, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. So I see uh, large T waves or quite tall T, T waves in um, V2, V3, um, as well as V1. Um, trying to look for any elevation. Mm. Mm. What can you tell me about the R waves in going across the chest leads? Sorry? What can you tell me about the R waves going across the chest leads? They are very tall. Yeah, very good. So what we see here, this is LVH in the left ventricular hypertrophy. And essentially, um, the uh, patients who have got quite, who have significant uh, LVH can also present with some degree of angina, even if they've got some mild coronary disease. And what you find here is that the heart muscles become very, very thickened. And what um, this may affect is the blood supply to the heart muscle when demand increases as well. So patients with severe LVH can present with angina symptoms, even though they might have very mild or uh, non-significant coronary disease when investigated on a, an angiogram. Okay, so that was a bit of a trick one, but well done. Uh, again, looking at sort of evolution of uh, ECGs over a period of time, so patients may present with very subtle changes, um, and then uh, within uh, a quite a short period of time, over an hour to more than 24 hours, you can get um, Q wave formation and also this tombstoning effect on the um, ST segments, um, and then you get this uh, persistent Q wave pattern there if, if left untreated. Um, if patients are not seen to very uh, in, uh, in the early um, period when they present, uh, leading to a um, full transmural uh, infarct. We talked about um, 
cardiac enzymes, and uh, this is just a graph to demonstrate how different enzymes uh, elevate peak very uh, at different intervals and how quickly they subside in serum. And you can see that uh, troponin um, uh, often takes a little bit uh, longer within about uh, six to uh, 20 hours for it to peak before it starts to subside. Whereas myoglobin, although it peaks very quickly, does subside very uh, quickly as well. And also, uh, may not be very specific if in, in, in patients who may have other underlying problems. So essentially, um, you know, we do two troponin tests and we have high sensitivity troponin and patients may have a blood test taken that's automatically sent now in presentation with chest pain. And then another one, depending on the hospital protocol, within three hours, six hours or uh, eight hours to see if there's any trend uh, in the troponin level. Uh, again, a whole host of problems that can lead to elevated troponin. So although it's very um, uh, useful to look at the trend of troponin blood tests over the course of um, a few hours over repeated results, remember can, uh, renal failure and um, patients who've got uh, PE can also present with uh, elevated troponin as well. Okay, uh, coronary angiogram. So uh, here is a, um, a, a diagram just demonstrating sort of the X-ray tube and image intensifier that's used uh, to demonstrate how images of the uh, coronaries are taken um, um, during a patient on the cath lab table. Uh, this is a, a slide uh, from a previous uh, SCTS education um, presentation on angiograms. And uh, essentially, a uh, contrast agent is injected into the, uh, into the either radial axis or most commonly nowadays are all the femoral, all the femoral arteries. And the catheter sits in the uh, aortic root and engaged in the uh, coronary ostia. And they take an image of the, um, of the coronaries. And essentially, what you're looking for is a reduction in the lumen size to determine whether there is a significant stenosis there, or there may be a complete occlusion and you might not get any passage of um, uh, contrast agent down the coronary artery. So that's referred to sort of as Timmy flowy, maybe if, uh, if you're working with cardiologists and they may refer to the degree of how much contrast is traveling down those coronary arteries. Okay. Um, I, I would recommend that you sit down with a cardiology reg or a cardiothoracic registrar to just get an idea of orientation on how to determine which coronary artery is uh, which and how we look for um, a stenosis and uh, other facts, other things that you can identify as well, interesting things such as whether there's a calcified leaflet, whether there's uh, aortic regurgitation, whether there's a VSD. So there's lots of interesting things that you can pick up on an angiogram, but essentially I'd recommend, you know, sit down, spend um, a, a session with the cardiothoracic registrar or cardiology registrar to go through some cases. And uh, it's really about getting the um, practice and uh, the more you see them, the more you get used to identifying the uh, anatomy. Um, so again, you can see here, there's the right coronary artery and that bifurcates into the PL branch and the PDA going into the bottom of the screen. And essentially, um, you can look at the size of the catheter tip that's sitting in the uh, coronary artery and comparing it with the diameter of the lumen size of the coronary artery and see how much reduction you have there. So left main stem, if you've got a, uh, remember, you're looking at a 2D uh, picture that represents a 3D structure. So if you've got a 30% reduction of the diameter of the left main, that, that means you've got about 50% stenosis. And if you've got a 50% stenosis in the diameter of a coronary artery, LAD or uh, circumflex OM or the right coronary artery, then you've got 70% stenosis there. So remember that you're putting your, what you're looking at is a reduction on the 2D uh, image and it means you're getting a uh, it translates to a reduction in a 3d structure so the cross-sectional area is reduced significantly so it's always important to comment on a coronary angiogram looking at a coronary artery in two different views because it may look significant in one view but in another view it may be within a normal limits as well 
other assessments uh, you can do via coronary angiogram, which is probably not as commonly done nowadays, is looking at LV function. So they inject some coronary uh, dye, contrast dye within the LV cavity, and you look at how well the um, different portions of the heart muscle are contracting, and you can identify areas of hypokinesia, akinesia, whether there's an aneurysm if patients are presented late and um, and they've got now complications of their um, of, of their coronary uh, disease as well. And so it's a very useful tool to determine what your LV function is uh, doing in, in that uh, context. Okay, so um, you need to also consider, so you've done your ECG, you've done your blood test, you've gone through, um, you've looked at troponins, you've had your coronary angiogram. Other aspects you need to consider really are, you know, what the LV function, and you know, like I said, LV uh, angiograms now, uh, left ventriculograms are not, uh, common anymore and echocardiograms may be much more easily performed uh, within a department either by the on-call cardiology reg or within uh, the um, by the echo techs in the, in the department and it essentially gives you an information of how the LV is behaving whether there's any other significant valvular problems that the patient's presented with um, does the heart show whether there's any evidence of a hibernating myocardium or a um, um, or, or, or that there's um, uh, aspects or areas of the heart muscle which are now akinetic or dyskinetic as well. Um, and further tests can be performed to establish uh, uh, whether there is um, uh, a degree of reversibility of their ischemia or whether ischemia can be induced with stress. And that's with using nuclear imaging, um, stress echocardiography, or um, MRI, which also can be done under stress or uh, using a contrast agent to look at any evidence of um, myocardial scar. Um, because what you want to establish if a patient has come in following an acute coronary event and they've had a massive MI and you're concerned that they've got a non-viable uh, heart muscle, then um, it's important to see whether there is any evidence of increased uh, contractility under stress or whether that heart muscle is non-viable anymore, and hence the um, patient needs to be uh, re-evaluated for other treatment options. So we've covered things like ang angiograms, there's obviously that needs to be done. Echocardiogram, again, um, it very helpful to determine the function of the left and right ventricle, any valvular abnormalities, and then may also indicate whether you need to do further viability studies as well, whether that's a stress echo or a contrast MRI. Blood tests are again very important because um, underlying other comorbidities can contribute to uh, uh, coronary artery uh, or angina type symptoms such as anemia, um, a hyperdynamic state such as having a um, uh, hypothyroid uh, condition can relate, lead to sort of palpitations and a fast heart rate and also induce angina. Um, and then Chest x-ray, again, very important to look at so what the lung feels look like, whether there's any pulmonary edema, uh, widened mediastinum, that may trigger your idea of doing a CT scan if you're concerned about an aortic dissection. You may see calcification on your angiogram or on your chest x-ray of the aorta, and so that may trigger for you to do a CT scan as well. Um, again, if you're thinking from a perspective of a surgical uh, doctor, a cardiothoracic uh, junior doctor, then you would want to look at the leg veins. Do the patients need to have a leg vein scan, a radial Doppler, um, uh, or further stress testing as well? Patients are often risk stratified as well, um, but um, that's often once they've been referred for surgery in the patients and they've been seen by a surgical team. So essentially nowadays, patients who present with um, coronary artery disease who are requiring um, consideration of coronary artery bypass surgery, they should be discussed at a multidisciplinary team meeting. So in that, you'd see a cardiac surgeon, you'd have a cardiologist, um, maybe other members of the, um, uh, of the healthcare team, such as uh, cardiac rehab nurses, um, geriatricians and stroke specialists, uh, maybe also a part of that meeting. And essentially, patients are discussed um, whether they should benefit from coronary artery bypass surgery versus medical therapy versus percutaneous treatment options. And if patients are 
as being considered for surgery, then often they, as part of their workup, following history investigations and all of the other investigations we've discussed about, you'd be able to establish whether um, what what sort of risk the patient has with regards to uh, undergoing an operation and what the risk of mortality is uh, from the procedure. We are driven by guidelines to help us to make a decision on what's best for the patient. And the guidelines I'm referring to here are the 2018 European guidelines on myocardial uh, revascularization. And um, I won't go into them into a lot, a lot of detail, but they give very uh, useful information about um, how patients should be investigated, um, the um, uh, different types of assessments for coronary artery disease. We didn't talk about functional assessment of coronary lesions using FFR, but if there is a particular lesion on the coronary angiogram that you're not quite sure about how significant it is, it doesn't look quite you know, it doesn't quite look 50% stenosed or we're not sure whether it's um, going to be a significant uh, lesion that's leading to ischemia, then a, a fractional flow reserve can be performed. That's basically a, a catheter that's passed through the coronary artery across the stenosis and it measures a pressure drop. Um, and uh, a value is generated to determine whether that's a significant lesion. And that could then mean that a patient should have that vessel stented or bypassed if they're going under coronary artery bypass surgery. So there's guidelines on how to work patients up. In the same, in the same booklet, I strongly recommend that you have a glance through this. Um, it gives you an indication of revascularization. And you can see here that um, you know, the extent of coronary artery disease, if a patient um, is uh, got a left main stenosis of more than 50%, or if there's proximal uh, LAD stenosis of more than 50%, it's a class 1A indication for uh, revascularization. Um, again, it's important to identify the risk of the operation or um, to the patient. Um, and so they're informed about what their mortality risk is of 30 day mortality or in hospital mortality after, after, after cabbage. Um, and again, this is a nice table which breaks down that depending on how many coronary arteries are diseased, uh, what the appropriate management should be uh, for the patient. Well, this is a cabbage versus PCI table. So it's very nice to sort of determine um, which patients should benefit uh, cabbage, which benefits would benefit from PCI. Again, these are guidelines. They go through, uh, patients go through an MDT discussion. The patient may be a candidate for um, uh, for surgery, but they may have significant underlying problems such as significant um, uh, pulmonary issues such as pulmonary fibrosis or significant emphysema that makes them a high anesthetic risk. And so even though the guidelines recommend patients should have a coronary artery bypass operation, they may still end up having a percutaneous uh, intervention because um, uh, the other comorbidities prohibit them from having uh, surgery. So the heart team, as I mentioned, you know, we sit uh, once or twice weekly, depending on the unit that you work in, to discuss all these cases uh, that uh, really would benefit either uh, Perkins coronary intervention or surgery. It's a very fundamental aspect of everyday practice now. We work very closely with our cardiologists and um, and you know and we rely a lot on their input and they rely a lot on our input as well so it's a very collaborative uh, um, speciality in this context because again the guidelines cover patients who've got poor rejection fraction and whether the evidence is uh, for uh, coronary artery bypass surgery or uh, pci so again have a have a look at these these are freely available on the um, eats European Association and the European Society of Cardiology websites. So coronary artery bypass surgery, this is our, one of the commonest operations that you, we do as, coron as cardiac surgeons. Uh, it's one of the most important surgical procedures that have been developed in the history of medicine and has uh, you know, shown that it prolongs life, provides symptom relief, and uh, has been extensively uh, investigated as well. 
looking at the sort of timeline of how it's developed, uh, Alexis Carroll uh, developed the uh, uh, procedure of uh, doing uh, vascular anastomoses, uh, which was uh, one of the key factors of which led on to the development on to coronary artery bypass surgery. Um, again, um, the discovery of the benefit of using the left internal mammary artery and then anastomosing that onto the LAD as a result of the development of the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit from the 1950s really paved way for the development of coronary artery bypass surgery. Then results from the European studies, uh, the CAS study, um, showed uh, the benefit of um, using the um, uh, LEMA to LAD, um, as well as the uh, famous papers from the Cleveland Clinic to suggest that uh, this has a, uh, a a uh, huge benefit in the prognosis for patients with coronary artery uh, disease as well. So it's a, it's a relatively new uh, speciality in the context with, for example, OBS and gynae or neurology. Um, however, the, it's always been at the forefront of innovation and development and constantly wanting to do better. So again, just a summary again of the development uh, with Vinberg's procedure of using the lemma to the myocardial surface, and then later um, anastomosing the left internal mammary artery to the um, LAD and um, using the long saphenous vein. Uh, again, uh, another landmark. And then in the 1970s, discovered using the um, uh, radial artery to be used as a, uh, as a conduit as well. This is one of the main reasons we patients undergo coronary artery bypass surgery, and that is the benefit of the left internal mammary artery being anastomosed to the left anterior descending uh, artery. And so essentially, once the chest is open, often we open the pericardium, and then we go on to lifting up the left side of the chest and then um, peeling down the uh, pedicle of the left internal mammary artery. And it uh, shows short and long-term survival benefits in this patient subgroup. Um, and um, now there is um, some debate and uh, research going into looking at whether using two uh, internal mammary arteries are beneficial um, as well. Again, certain patient factors may prohibit the use of that as well. Um, Radial artery, again, has been studied very extensively as well. And uh, it, uh, again, shows very good patency rates as well. Um, one of the main uh, worries about using, uh, some surgeons may have concerns about using this. So first of all, you need to make sure that you're anastomosing a radial artery onto a coronary lesion, which has uh, is it got significant stenosis. Um, so it has to be a severe disease in the coronary artery. Um, and also the, the behavior of the radial artery following um, use as well. So some uh, times we see that the radial arteries spasm because they have quite a thick media layer. As you know, the vessels, uh, arterial arteries have three layers, adventitia, media, and intima. The radial artery has a very um, thick media and it can often go into spasm. And so obviously the concern is that whether you, once you've done the anastomosis onto the heart, the worry is that um, whether it can lead to spasm in some patients, some surgeons will uh, use a cocktail of calcium channel blockers or nitrates to keep the vessels relaxed. Um, others try not to handle the artery too much to prevent any uh, spasm in this context. The long saphenous vein is a very versatile vein. It's easily accessible. It can be uh, used by endoscopic harvesting. Radial artery is also being used now as a uh, as a as a endoscopic harvest as well, but saphenous vein is one of the first vessels to be harvested by endoscopic techniques. It's readily available, um, and it shows great uh, patency rates. Um, so uh, in some in some studies, it shows that it surpasses radial artery patency as well. So um, and it depends on the techniques that you're using to harvest it, whether it's a no touch technique, and uh, whether it's uh, using. Um, uh, the vein as a uh, um, with a sort of a fatty pedicle um, or whether it's harvested by endoscopic techniques. Um, as I mentioned, cardiopulmonary bypass, the, the uh, innovation of this and how it's developed has re revolutionized cardiac surgery and gave birth to cardiac surgery. 
And so there are various considerations that we have to make when we're assessing a patient who may need to undergo cabbage procedures. So is their aorta free from any disease? Do they have any calcification in the aorta? Because we're going to put a cannula in their ascending aorta. So um, if the aorta is very significantly diseased, then we may not be able to um, uh, put a cannula in the aorta or clamp the aorta if we want to attach them to a bypass circuit. Um, and so we might have to consider other options such as off-pump coronary artery bypass surgery as well. So when conducting an operation, we want to make sure that uh, we have meticulous hemostasis, the patient doesn't lose any blood. Uh, as I mentioned, we open the pericardium, we want to harvest the conduits, make sure that we've got enough uh, conduit available, and ensure that the target vessels that we want to anastomose are uh, uh, are um, are achievable to be anastomosed. There's no other issues with regards to whether the coronary artery targets are subendocardial or, un, um, or difficult to identify. And so if you think when we are doing a coronary artery bypass operation, it's divided into different stages. First of all is the access, opening the chest. Secondly, the um, uh, harvesting of the conduits, so the mammary and the vein, and then also uh, the next stage is assessing the patient, whether they've got a soft aorta, whether it's possible to do this on the coronary, on, the, on pump, uh, whether the coronary arteries can be uh, anastomosed, and then whether you've got enough conduit length. So can you do this as separate grafts or do you need to do jump grafts? Um, and also constantly being wary of, is the heart comfortable? Is it safe? Do we need to establish cardiopulmonary bypass quickly to relax the heart? Um, to rest to rest the heart um, and these are other sort of factors as well as part of the consideration of the operation of how cool you reduce the body temperature and how you um, drain um, blood entering the heart while you're doing your operation so the heart doesn't warm up so lots of different operative that's a whole lecture in itself on the uh, operative considerations as well so operative um, uh, techniques, we can do the standard technique, we, which is done commonly and has excellent results using a mammary vein on cardiopulmonary bypass with an arrested heart. Your heart's protected with cardioplegia, or you may want to review the use of doing total arterial using bilateral mammary, radial artery, um, or the mammary and vein, whether it's on pump or off pump. So again, coronary artery bypass surgery is becoming a subspeciality on its own. There's different techniques to, to do this, whether you're doing it through a medium stenotomy or through a small incision, and it really depends on how stable your patient is and the type of coronary disease they have and uh, what the expertise of the unit is as well. So at the end of the day, the target is to achieve a safe operation with an alive patient that can go home who is free of any symptoms and you've done them the benefit of having a coronary artery bypass operation. And that's the main priority. The other things, whether it's on pump or off pump, whether it's total arterial, mammary, venous, it really depends on the patient factors, surgeon expertise, the unit's um, experience, and um, also um, uh, what the patient is also uh, uh, informed about these days as well, what, they, what they're aware and what they want. Some people want a small incision, um, and others uh, dread the idea of going on cardiopulmonary bypass. Myocardial protection, again, this is another whole lecture in itself discussing about um, how we protect the heart, giving cardioplegia to uh, rest the heart and doing an operation in a bloodless field as well. So again, um, it's very important to uh, uh, look at what your strategy is within the department and within your unit and how you can offer this operation. Obviously, this is not an issue when you're doing off-pump uh, surgery, it's when you're doing uh, surgery via cardiopulmonary bypass. Sorry to, uh, sorry to interrupt you, so just to let you know, we've reached the uh, one hour mark. Uh, continue with the talk, but I just thought that you know. Sure, if, you, if, the, if the audience wants me to finish early, let me know, but I'll, I'll crack on. I, I don't think we've got much more to go through actually, so thanks for letting me know. So here's just some operative pictures. Here on the left, we've got an open chest here. Uh, with a retractor, quite an, an old-fashioned retractor with some old-fashioned cannulas in place. And it's not, sorry for the poor images. I didn't have any video images to show you, but there's lots of, of um, um, videos on, on YouTube. Again, here on the right, we've got um, a radial artery being harvested as well. 
uh, with um, uh, as a pedicle, and below you've got someone harvesting it, left internal mammary artery. Um, other factors and uh, operative factors that you need to consider is, you know, how well the heart is, can be, how, how, how well the heart can be mobilized. I won't go into too much detail about this because there's more very specific um, details about the uh, sub speciality of coronary artery bypass surgery and off pump coronary artery surgery. Um, just quickly, the, so, you know, you avoid the use of cardiopulmonary bypass. A, Putting a patient circulation or blood going through a cardiopulmonary bypass circuit can lead to inflammation and um, they can get an inflammatory response. Patient's body temperature also gets cooled quite quickly. And so there are a whole host of uh, benefits of using patient doing an operation off pump, whether that's keeping the patient warm, reducing the re requirement of um, blood transfusion, and questionably whether the patient has a quicker discharge or not, that's still to be determined. Um, then the operation itself, doing the anastomosis, is a very intricate and a very exciting uh, part of the operation, and it's something that trainees in cardiothoracic surgery will be trained to do uh, throughout their um, uh, from you know ST one to ST eight, ST seven, and um, and you will be you know taught elements of the operation before putting it all together. But doing the anastomosis is one of the most satisfying parts of the operation identifying the coronary artery, opening it in a safe way, fashioning the conduit, and then stitching using 6070 8 sutures to bring the two ends together. It's very satisfying and it brings a whole uh, benefit to the patient by restoring the blood supply to the heart muscle. I had some clinical scenarios uh, here, but uh, I think I'll skip these because these were aimed at um, some of the senior trainees. Um, yeah, I might go through this one actually. Uh, so you've got a uh, patient who's undergone a um, uh, previous um, 78 year old patient been referred for cabbage. He says he's got significant triple vessel disease in the LAD, OM, RCA, PDA branches. He's got background type two diabetes. Um, he's had varicose vein stripping in both legs, um, and he's had an echo and an angiography. What other imaging study would you want to have preoperatively? Anyone, either chat or from the participants as well. Would you duplex his arms? Yeah, very good. So you'd want to duplex his arms. You want to establish whether he's got um, radials that could be harvested. Very good. And anything else? I want to see the patency of his uh, great saphenous veins. I know he's had um, varicose vein stripping. Yeah. I want to see whether that would, that would affect uh, the conduit that we take from his leg. Very good. Yeah. So uh, essentially, you want to see, you know, whether there's any residual. Sometimes you, say you leave some vein behind. There may be something there in the thigh, uh, or the short saphenous vein as well. You want to image that, and also a CT scan is also useful to look at the um, mammary arteries as well to uh, see whether that's useful. Okay. Good. Uh, I'm going to stop there. Um, maybe some questions from the.